obviously GDP gross domestic product growth, very interconnected. Kuznet said, please don't measure human... There was a gentleman behind the idea of GDP, said please don't measure human progress with GDP. Mm. But in this era, we obviously still live in a democratic era. Um, mass public participation, one person, one vote in the UK, US, number of other countries. It makes it very easy to understand when you say 2.5% GDP, we're growing so well, you've mm. got a, a sort of technocratic class who you get the economist every week and literally at the back, almost like the football results, you've got the GDP scores. Yeah. Do you not think that socialists or post-capitalists, whatever you want to call them, do you not think that we similarly would need some kind of metric by which by which to judge the success of any potential economic system? Yes, and I, I just I do want to take on this point because I heard what George said about GDP. GDP is if you think of 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 a car and the speedometer on the car, the speedometer tells you the rate at which you're travelling, the speed at which you're travelling, and the. Sp- the speedometer is not the problem. The problem is the accelerator. The problem is the driver behind the wheel. The problem is the car, capitalism. Um, the measure of what's happening, and the GDP is a measure. The GDP is a measure of the total activity. As far as we can count it, mm. we count up. We can count how many people are in, in employment. We can count how much money is going into uh, green technology. These things are countable, and the fact that we can count them is okay, in my view, is not a problem. The question really is um, the driving force behind GDP. What is it? You know, it is that GDP must rise, as you say, every week the football score of it rising yeah. up, up, up. It must never go down, you know. And in fact, GDP has to go down. We have to, we have to extract less from the earth. We have to exclude uh, fossil fuels from our counting. We've just got to block them out. You know. didn't, cause Netsu, didn't he say that finance shouldn't be included in GDP? I mean, yeah. this has been a debate, Indeed. hasn't it? Or, no, yeah. no, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, what it, that should not be included because I mean, that's all very complicated. We yeah. don't want to get into too they much. They need to buy your book for that one. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, these are intangibles and these are intangibles but mainly because, I mean, it's all too complicated, but we've turned intangible things like trust into assets. We've commodified absolutely almost everything we could possibly commodify and modify and, and monetize as capitalism. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's all crazy. We, we must stop doing that too. But we'll never stop counting. I hope we don't, because for me, that is what science does. We, we have to measure how much oil is coming out of the earth and how yeah. much must be must stay behind and someone's got to do that measuring but the question re- we really have to address is do we extract that oil or not those are the big issues yeah, there's a really interesting paper just been published by jason hickel and uh, georgios kalos yeah um looking at this whole idea of green growth you know that yeah. so can we dematerialize growth can we decouple growth uh, economic growth from material resource consumption and it's 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 a very thorough paper. It's a very good one, and it shows definitively we cannot. Mm. That there, um, while there was some relative What's the citation dec- for this for viewers, uh, it's new. I think it's called New Political Economy or something. It's 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 it's, in, it's a new journal actually. I think this is its very first edition. Um, Jason Hickel and Georgios Kalos. Um, and it's, right, it's, uh, it's, I think the title is Degrowth. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's something like. Um, is green growth possible? I think that's the title. Right. Um, so, anyway, it's 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 a very rigorous um, look at at this question because you know it, it's intrinsic to all the models. You know, if you look at UNEP, if you look at OECD, if you yeah, look at the World yeah. Bank, they all say, "Oh, it's fine because we'll just decouple. We'll de- decouple growth. We're switching from goods to services, yeah. so it's going to happen anyway. We'll just dematerialize the economy. Yeah. It's not happening. I mean, what's so interesting is that during the twentieth century. There was some relative decoupling. In other words, material resources were still rising, but it was rising more slowly than economic growth, than, yeah. than, than GDP rate. In the 21st century, there's been a recoupling where material resource use is rising as fast or faster than, 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 than GDP. Um, and and we're, we're going in exactly the wrong direction, if, if that's what you want to do. As for the absolute decoupling, in other words, a, an overall reduction in material resource use, they demonstrate pretty convincingly that it is physically impossible while an economy is growing. You just cannot 
do it and and they've they've done a very thorough literature survey it's terrifying you know and, and you basically come to the end of that and say you cannot continue to have economic growth and continue to have life on earth the two things are incompatible can i just respond quickly and then i'll get your opinions opinions on this so we know for instance in the us <clears throat> uk most of europe carbon emissions have been falling since about 2000 mm. Um, although GDP, although quite slowly in this country since 2000, has still gone up. So there has been something of a sort of... The argument is that there's basically a sort of hard limit on the amount of CO2 emissions a country per capita will emit. Almost like, you know, there was uh, declining birth rates, increased life expectancy. Now they're saying that one of the sort of hallmarks of capitalist development is a, is a, is a cap on carbon emissions. Mm. Do you think that's simply because all the production is being done in the global south, right. or is well, there... there? There's a couple of things to say here. That, that so while there has been no absolute decoupling of material resource use, and there can't be with economic yeah. growth, with um, carbon production, um, that uh, carbon dioxide production, there has been an absolute decoupling, even taking into account outsourced emissions elsewhere. What the paper shows is that that is nowhere near enough to hit the targets which we signed up to under the Paris Agreement, let alone what we actually need to do if we're going to produce um, no more than 1.5 degrees of global heating, let alone two degrees of glo or even two degrees of global heating. I mean, they're saying you know if economic growth continues, you're talking about seven, eight, maybe 11, 12 percent cuts per year. Um, in order to, to 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 meet those targets, and you know that is three, four, five times what any economy has managed to achieve. So, again, while you know you might you, you can look at this and say, oh, you know, we've got the lowest emissions per capita we've had since 1888 or something like that in this country. Isn't that an amazing achievement? And you say, actually. By comparison to where we need to be, it's nothing. It's nowhere near. And so, where more, we need we've to already be. stocked the atmosphere with full of carbon anyway, mm -hmm. thanks to mm -hmm. past activities. But you see, the thing is, I, I mean, I'm, I think I'm going to um, diverge here from you, George, on this point because for me, um, a green and a sustainable economy will be a high employment economy. Mm -hmm. For me, labour will have to substitute for carbon. We're going to have to grow our own green beans. We're not going to be able to import them by plane. We're going to have to walk. You know, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to become much more nationally self-sufficient. And that's going to be labour intensive. And I have been on platforms with green MEPs and so on who've argued that actually, no, we have to have high levels of unemployment. So when I, when we talk about growth, and I don't want us to talk about that because it's such a neoliberal concept. I want us to talk about what level of economic activity would be sustainable and how much of that should we devote towards labour and how much of labour must be labour, for example, in uh, activities that don't use material resources, you know, education, the arts, creativity, care, all of those things. There's an awful lot to be done, in my view, that doesn't need uh, to be fueled by carbon. And, and how much of that, you know, how are we going to organise a, a society to make it sustainable? And whenever I talk about this, I think of Egypt and I think of the millions of un young unemployed people in Egypt. And I think of the ecological devastation that is the result of a society living on high levels of unemployment. So I don't want to ever talk about growth, but I do want to talk about what, do, what kind of economic activity would we required to maintain our solidarity, our civilization, our ability to live in community. And for me, we've got to be talking about national self-sufficiency far more. We've got to be self-sufficient. We've got to, you know, feed ourselves. We've got to be able to make our own clothes. We've got to be able to walk around and cycle around. These are all things we're going to have to think about a new and envisage a new world. But it's going to have some economic activity in it, and we've just got to address Can that. Can I respond to both of you here? Because yeah. we've talked a bit about GDP growth, but you've talked about something important there, which is the nation state yeah. and the importance of returning to sort of nationally oriented economies. I agree with you. I don't think I don't see how else you're going to be able to do this. Yeah. And often the sort of the cliche amongst the left is because Marx made this observation correctly. You know, uh, over time production becomes ever more socialized, 
ever more globalized. Well, actually, when it comes to agriculture, we, we probably need to deglobalize quite significantly. Absolutely. But but the left would say that's you know oh well that's actually um, that's almost foreshadowing the possibility of a return of national socialism. And yeah. do you think do you think that's a a sort of um, a bit of a lacuna for the left? where they don't really engage with the national question, not the national as in an identitarian issue, but the nation state as that locus of economic production. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a problem with it, and I think there is a, a worry there about nationalism, and I'm deeply against nationalism, having grown up in a nationalist state. Um, what I think is really important is the, is the idea of self-sufficiency, of not being having to extract assets from other parts of the world for our own survival purposes. But there will be countries, and they are in Africa, which cannot be self-sufficient on their own because they're too small. They will want to have regional alliances and they will want to work together with their neighbours, you know, who will have more water or more land or be able to grow things they can't grow or whatever. So, you know, I don't think it's... What I, I think the important concept is self-sufficiency, is this, the idea that you cannot live by just exploiting other parts of the world and by you know importing, exporting, all of this stuff. This is not, not going to be sustainable. I say that because Rio Earth Summit's 1992, and yeah. since then, <clears throat> the sort of common sense, which has percolated all the way down to your everyday sort of liberal left activist, is we can only have global solutions to this. No, that's which, rubbish. Which, in a sense, it's true. I mean, Britain's only like 2% of world CO2 yeah, emissions. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it seems to me, I mean, let's see what you think about this, George, that's almost provided a license for sort of political inertia. And even yeah. even worse than not doing anything, it's given almost the outward appearance of doing something and being invested and actually transitioning the economy, where in fact that was never really on the table. Can I just say this quickly? <laughs> that when we were running the Jubilee 2000 campaign, the World Bank and the big, uh, the big charities in the United States wanted us to play a part in growing a global civil society to match global capitalism. You know, a global civil society was going to hold capitalism to account. And I said, no, we're not playing that game, right? Because a global c civil society is accountable to whom? You know, doesn't and, exist, right? Well, no, that's my and, <laughs> and, and, you know, the idea, all you're asking us to do is to reinforce global capitalism. No, thank you. Mm. Having said that, we want international cooperation and coordination. We want to be able to work with our neighbours and, you know, we want international alliances. But we don't want a sort of globalised state, which is what globalisation is and wants, basically, in my view. Mm.